Blessings, precious ones. This is Something More. I'm your host, Pastor Morris. I'm joined with uh, this beautiful man of God, uh, David Dega Hernandez. Precious and beautiful, even powerful. And I'm honored, man, to be here with you this morning. Well, I'm happy to be here with you. David, um, I was looking at some of your material and I found out you got saved at 11. 11 gave years your old. life to the Lord at 11, but then started preaching at 13. So one of the questions I had when I, when I saw that is, how were you able to maintain consistency or did you, or did you go off course? Did you preach for a little while and then stop or how did that go? I'll put it succinctly and then I'll explain. Simply clinging to Jesus. Come on. Yeah. I didn't keep him. He kept me. That's good. And so I grew up in a Christian home. I'm a fourth generation Christian third generation preacher. I believe that there was some godly heritage that was established uh, from which I greatly benefited. And I was saved at 11. I still remember that day at a Bible conference. I wasn't in the service, but in the hotel room after the service, I was saved. My father prayed the prayer with me and I sincerely put my faith and hope in Jesus, put my faith in that finished work, believed on the Son of God and bondages were broken. The burden of sin lifted. And from then, there was just this spiritual hunger that began to develop. It was by the Holy Spirit. Psalm 80, 18 says, quicken us and we'll call unto you. Yeah. He gives us the desire. We must implement the decision. We must implement the discipline. So the Holy Spirit begins to give me this hunger to know Jesus. He glorifies Jesus. That's what the Holy That's Spirit good. does. He yeah. glorifies yeah. Jesus. And so everything in me wanted to truly know Jesus. I had known growing up Jesus socially. My family was a Christian family. I knew Jesus historically. I knew Jesus intellectually. I'd memorized many scriptures, understood the Bible, but I had never known Jesus personally. And so I became fascinated with, obsessed with the person of Jesus. And so I told the Lord, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know your nature. I want to know your mind. I want to know your power. I want to know all I can. I just want to know you. I remember when I would pray that prayer, even my whole body would tense and I would say, I want to know you with everything that I have. And the Holy Spirit began to draw me into the deeper places of prayer. And for two years, praying four to eight hours a day. That's not me bragging on myself. That's just how wonderful Jesus is that an 11, 12 year old boy would spend four to eight hours just in the room getting to know him, reading dozens of chapters of the Bible a day. And the, the, the scriptures came alive as the Holy Spirit began to reveal them. Let me stop you just for a minute. Yes, sir. How in the world does an 11 year old child desire depth of relationship with Holy Spirit? Man, that's, that's, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a work of God. It's a work of God. And again, I believe some of it has to do with God working through the generations in my family. Now, this doesn't mean that if someone doesn't have a spiritual uh, heritage or generations of preachers that they can't encounter God at a young age. I believe anyone can encounter God at any age because God is the one who initiates that, who reveals himself. And I believe he calls to everyone. Everyone is given this royal invitation and it's up to us to respond to that. So at that age, I began to pray, read the word, and that overflow is what eventually became a ministry. I like to say that all true ministry is simply an overflow of your relationship with Jesus. And if it's not an overflow of your relationship with Jesus, it's not preaching, it's motivational speaking. It's not ministry, it's just charity work. It's not really a church service. It's just a gathering. It's not necessarily something that's done in the power of the Holy Spirit when you do it in your own strength. So in that, at what point did you recognize that there was a call to preach? I, I don't necessarily think that there was an instance where I saw that there's a call. I think there was just a desire for other people to experience what I was experiencing to know the Jesus who I had come to know. Yeah. And so this overflow begins to happen and I start evangelizing at my school. And of course, if you preach salvation, healing will come along with that. And so I'm, I'm witnessing to my friends, they're getting saved and then healed and then experiencing the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It all just flowed so naturally. It wasn't forced. With the Holy Spirit, you can't fight him, you can't force him. You just have to flow with him. Okay. 
were you bullied at school for talking about of Jesus? Of course, of course. <laughs> that's the thing that's I, going through my not mind. Only that, is, is I would go to the, the house parties just to preach the gospel. So I'd have beer bottles thrown at me and uh, demons would manifest as I'm preaching at house parties. In particular, my strategy, maybe not the best, but I was very zealous. My strategy was to go into the house party and say, hey, there's a lot of underage drinking going on here. Give me five minutes or I'll call the police. They say, okay, take your five minutes and then get out of here. I said, deal. So I would take that five minutes, they'd shut the music off and I would stand up and begin preaching. And so sometimes people would manifest, but every so often someone would walk out of that party with me giving their life to Jesus. So I was very passionate about people knowing <laughs> the gospel. <laughs> I'm laughing, brother, because um, as you talk about the evidence of Holy Spirit on the inside of you, Holy Spirit boldness is one of the uh, one of the resources that you give in terms of knowing that you are Holy Spirit filled. And I hear that at, at an early age, there is this boldness in you, particularly to be able to shun peer pressure. I mean, that's incredible. That's Holy Spirit. Well, when you're focused on Jesus, you're not focused on yourself. And when you're not focused on yourself, your reputation doesn't mean anything to you. Wow. That's why people ask me, were you nervous when you would preach? I'd say, well, no, I wasn't even thinking about me. My, my, my thoughts were on the people and are they going to encounter God and how, how can I best present Jesus? And so take yourself out of the equation. I think that's also one of the best forms of developing compassion. You start like, like Jesus was moved with compassion. This is after he, uh, John, John was killed. He's moved with compassion for these people because he was so focused on them and not his own pain okay. that he's now bringing healing. So I think that's one of the keys to boldness is focusing on the lost, focusing on the sick, focusing on those who need God's touch. And you become so consumed with compassion for them. Got to stop you. Yes, sir. For a minute. We're going to go into another session, okay. so we're going to take a break here. But when we come back, saints, we're going to uh, talk about uh, some of the biblical evidences that will assure you that Holy Spirit uh, abides on the inside of you. David's going to explain some of those, so stay with us, okay? Hey, welcome back. There's something more. I'm Pastor Morris, uh, and joining me here in the studio is uh, David Diga Hernandez, and we've been having a wonderful conversation. And we want to talk to you. Uh, David's going to explain to us uh, some of the biblical signs that will assure you that Holy Spirit abides on the inside of you. So, David, you want to take a moment, just kind of lead us into that? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's important to explain why I was led by the Spirit to put together this, this yeah. thought. Um, you know, I had a severe battle with anxiety. And so even as a Christian and as a minister who battled with, for a season, severe anxiety, there were certain things that would produce in me anxiety that were actually biblical. Things like, or I should say doctrines like, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the rapture of the church, um, Matthew chapter 7, where many come to the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? I would find these quite anxiety inducing, even as a born again believer. So sometimes Christians who deal with anxiety or anxious thoughts, they'll hear teachings like that. And even though they're saved, even though they're born again, even though they put their faith and trust in Jesus, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 makes it clear that you put your faith in Jesus. This is what brings forth salvation. It's not of works so no one can boast. So even though they know they're born again, there are still these moments of doubt that can be quite crippling. Yeah, We're called yeah. to be vigilant, but not paranoid, holy, but not fearful. And so this is why I, I put this together, these thoughts, because I myself wanted to know, okay, well, how do I know I have the Holy Spirit? Because every time I hear a sermon on this or that, you know, your first thought is always worst case scenario. If you've ever battled anxiety, anxiety takes you to worst case scenario. So worst case scenario is always, well, that's me. You hear about the rapture? Well, I'm going to be left behind. You hear about those saying, Lord, Lord, well, that's going to be me on that day. And so one of the first signs, I'll, I'll get right to it. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 16 tells us that the Holy Spirit joins with our spirit okay. to affirm that we are children of God, that we belong to him, that we're born again. This is one of the greatest works, I believe, of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. He is that inner witness. Now, 
This does not necessarily mean that there won't be moments where you wonder, well, gee, I hope I got it right, or, you know, I hope I actually read that correctly, or I want to make sure I'm being diligent about understanding my salvation in Christ. There's nothing wrong with wanting to understand it and wanting to reaffirm that as you read the scriptures. And especially people who battle with anxiety, their thoughts will always tend toward that. But this simply means that deep down, there is this witness of the Holy Spirit, and he's confirming to you that you are born again. The people who don't know Jesus don't have the Holy Spirit. And the people who don't have the Holy Spirit are not children of God. You've heard it said, we're all children of God. Well, Romans chapter eight makes it clear that no, that is in fact not the case. Only those who have the Holy Spirit are children of God. And those who put their faith in Jesus receive the Holy Spirit. And by the way, at the very moment of salvation, Ephesians is very clear that the Holy Spirit seals us unto salvation. The Bible is very clear that the Holy Spirit is present at the moment of salvation. Think about the fact that when Jesus talked about being born again, you must be born again of the Spirit. This is a work of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is. How often is it for saints to question whether or not they're filled with Holy Spirit? I wouldn't necessarily put it in terms of frequency but in scenarios okay. in that it's not necessarily that those who battle with this in type of this type of anxiety uh, do it in a certain frequency. It's that they do it when they're under a certain mindset. And that mindset is legalism. Legalism, wow. which is man's attempt wow. at reaching God, man's attempt to earn their own salvation by doing works. Now we understand that we do good works as a response to salvation. Good works don't save us. Salvation produces good works. When we are born again, God gives us new desires, and out of that come the good works that we're called to do. But no one by their own merit or by their own hand could ever save themselves through good works. So good works are the fruit of salvation. They are not the root of salvation. And so when someone is bound under legalism, uh, one of the signs of this is that they live with the constant fear of losing their salvation, and they think that every mistake that they make was their last, and that God is finally finished with them. Now... When I looked at uh, the, the biblical signs that you are listening to your teachings, um, I immediately began to think, man, I, don't, I, I can't check all of those off, you know, uh, yet I'm, I'm confident in my relationship with Holy Spirit, but I'm thinking how many uh, believers are there out there that truly uh, just uh, struggle with relationship with Holy Spirit in terms of him being there. I mean, we know Jesus has said he's released Holy Spirit to live and abide on the inside of us. Yet my ability to believe that, my ability to have confidence in that is strained. Do you find that? Well, that's why I tell believers that we don't go by feelings, we go by faith. Don't wait for your feelings and your experience to confirm something that the Word of God already tells you. The Word of God says it, believe it not because your experience caught up to it or because you now feel it, but because God said it. If God said it, I'm going to believe it. And every word he says is true. And that comes from the Holy Spirit, which is, uh, again, that inner witness is a major sign that you have the Holy Spirit. Another one, uh, which you're kind of touching on here, is that, that, that knowing of the truth. So John 14, 26 makes it clear that the Holy Spirit teaches us. So the Holy Spirit also reveals truth. Now, when I give other signs in a moment, like, um, Acts chapter 1, 8, one of the signs is power. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the character of Christ or the fruits of the Holy Spirit. These are signs that you have the Holy Spirit, but it's not necessarily that you have to have these signs in perfection okay. because you. there's a process to all of this. But, you know, when you see that assurance begin to develop in your life, who's giving you that assurance? Like, right, like the believer right. who's struggling to be free from sin. 1 Peter 1, 2 makes it clear that one of the signs of having the Holy Spirit, hello, is... Holiness, you know, he is, I I call him the holiness spirit. So holiness is also a sign that you have the Holy Spirit, but using that as an example to answer your question, um, holiness comes through the process of sanctification. But the very fact that I desire to be holy is proof that the Holy Spirit lives in me. Many believers think that when they're struggling to overcome a certain sin in their life, that it's proof that they don't belong to God or that they're fakes or that they're not a true child of God. I've got to wrap it up this okay. session here. We'll come back. We're going to uh, just turn David loose on you again here. Uh, one of the questions I want to I want you to address is when people out of legalism come to your church struggling with re- relationship and identity, how do you deal with that? We'll be back shortly. Thank you for joining us. I can't wait to get back to this conversation.
Get on board the deliverance movement happening right now when you call or go online at SidRoth.org to get David Hernandez's brand new book, Holy Spirit, The Bondage Breaker. Experience permanent deliverance from mental, emotional, and demonic strongholds. You will also receive David's brand new and exclusive three-part audio CD teaching series, Help Me Holy Spirit. Plus, get his bonus DVD, Consume Me Holy Spirit. All yours for a donation of $39. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number number 9913. With David's new book, you will break sinful habits and have victory over repeating cycles of bondage, overcome long-standing strongholds of addiction, apathy, depression, demonic accusations against you, ungodly thoughts and imaginations, and more. In my three CD audio teaching, Help Me Holy Spirit, I want to show you how to stay free by living in the Holy Spirit. David Hernandez saw how many believers don't practice the principles of living in the Spirit, so they gained victory for only a few days or weeks. Then through David's encounters with God, truths were revealed letting him exchange bondage for freedom. And you can too. David shows you how deeper fellowship with the Holy Spirit enables you to finally walk in authority, power, and victory. You can be free permanently. God did not call you to go from deliverance to deliverance. He called you to go from deliverance to discipline to dominion, to walk in the permanent freedom, the permanent victory that Christ died to give to you. On David's bonus DVD, you'll witness a new move of glory as many were healed, delivered, and experienced the miraculous. It was even reported that angelic voices were heard worshiping. There are those services where you're pressing into God. In this particular service, it was as though God was pressing into us. Call or go online at SidRoth.org to get David Hernandez's brand new book, Holy Spirit, The Bondage Breaker. Experience permanent deliverance from mental, emotional, and demonic strongholds. You will also receive David's brand new and exclusive three-part audio CD teaching series, Help Me Holy Spirit. Plus, get his bonus DVD, Consume Me Holy Spirit. It's all yours for a donation of $39. Shipping and handling is included. Ask for offer number 9913 or send your check to Sid Roth. It's Supernatural, P.O. Box 39222, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28278. Please specify offer number 9913. Welcome back, Saints. Uh, I'm Pastor Morris, and joining me is uh, David Diga Hernandez. And you were t finishing up a thought before I interrupted you. Please forgive me. So go ahead and finish your thought. Can I just say, friend. I love that you're inserting questions. It helps to stir the spirit in me. I love okay. it. Okay. Well, because so, I was so, getting rebuked by the devil for doing it. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, honestly, honestly, I really, it helps me to process. The questions help me. Very good. Um, but we were talking about the fact that many individuals see themselves as fakes or hypocrites because they're struggling to overcome a sin. Now, we understand that if you're just allowing sin in your life and you're doing nothing about it and you're just living in full compromise, then that actually might be a sign that you're not truly born again because true born again believers have a desire at least to be free from sin. So the believer wow. who is struggling wow. and desires, they're, they're working, they're overcoming, they're praying, Lord, help me with this. And they're getting frustrated with themselves. Like Paul the Apostle who wrote, I do the things I don't want to do and the things I want to wow. do, I can't that's do. Good. Okay, that's the believer, right? So they look at that and they say, well, this must be a sign that I don't have the Holy Spirit. But think about this. The scripture says in Galatians that the spirit fights against the flesh and the flesh fights against the spirit. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, who is it in you that's fighting the flesh? The very fact that you are fighting with sin is proof that the Holy Spirit is in you because otherwise you wouldn't be fighting with sin, you'd be living in it. Wow, wow. And th that's the explanation that you would give someone that comes to your ministry having been steeped in legalism and uh, struggling with relationship. I mean... Well, it's one of the things I would definitely think that would come up in conversation with someone who struggles with legalism. Uh, but fundamentally someone who struggles with legalism thinks that they bear the responsibility of bringing yeah. themselves salvation. And even so, this manifests itself in long-term guilt for sins that were long ago forgiven, or constantly living under the accusation of the enemy, or having difficulty receiving blessing or favor from God because they view themselves as a worm before God. Yes, we understand that we were sinners. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ, Christ died for us, He loved us. Uh, but even in that, the Bible refers to us that as in past tense. We are not sinners, we're now saints. 
And so we have to recognize our new identity, not because of anything that we've done, but because of everything that he has done. So the believer who's battling with legalism may, for example, uh, never really experience the fullness of joy because in some very subtle way, they think that they're punishing themselves for a sin that they still deserve punishment for. Now, of course, we still deserve punishment for sin, but because of God's compassion and mercy, he's absorbed that wrath and now invites us to live in freedom and live in joy and live in love and live in peace. And so what they're doing is, is it's almost like penance. They're emotionally whipping themselves on the right, back, right. saying, well, I, I could be forgiven, God forgives me, but I still need to carry this a little bit. Or I still need, I, I'm not going to allow myself to enjoy my life too much. I'm not going to allow myself to receive blessings too much. Let, let me stop you right there. Yeah. I was thinking as you were talking about this liberty that we have, and I'm thinking that when you had the encounter at 11 years old, and this deep desire came upon you to, to enter into a deeper relationship with Holy Spirit, those that come to your ministry haven't been steeped in legalism. Do they experience that same type of encounter have, you know, because th that same presence that was on you then is still on you now. My point is, do you think if people come into your arena where you're ministering, they catch that spirit? Well, I think the Holy Spirit moves in his meetings, certainly. And I think that one encounter with God can do more for us than anything that we can do for ourselves over any period of time. The Holy Spirit can do more in a moment than you and I could accomplish in a hundred years. So just like uh, Paul uh, went from Saul to Paul, he was steeped in legalism, so much so wow. that he was driven to wow. persecute the church. He has one encounter with Jesus. Suddenly, the presence of the Holy Spirit comes upon his life. And now looking at the scriptures that he had memorized all those years, he sees Jesus in them. So, so yes, good. the Holy Spirit's presence works with the Word. Of course, the Word and Spirit work together. They're not contradictory to one another. Um, so I think an encounter with God definitely can break that. Um, but if someone finds themselves tending toward those old thought patterns, I would say they have to identify the root lie of legalism, which is this idea that I am working for my salvation. Now, again, I want to be clear so I don't get accused of preaching sloppy grace. True believers truly desire to live holy. True believers yeah. will pursue holiness. They will cooperate with God's process of sanctification. So I'm not saying we're free to sin. I'm saying we're free from sin and the consequences of sin when we embrace the cross. I put an amen on that, brother. <laughs> That's beautiful. That is beautiful. So now those are some of the signs. What is one of the, you know, one of the most pertinent signs? Well, I would go back to what I had said in the last segment, which was Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 the fruit of the Spirit, or the character of Christ. I believe in speaking in tongues, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4, 2 and 4. Um, of course, I believe in the spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12. I believe in the manifestations of power. I believe in prophecy. All those things are wonderful, but those aren't the primary indicators that you have the Holy Spirit. So what if you speak in tongues and then you're cussing your wife out the very next day? Come on. So what if you lay hands on the sick and they recover but then you're doing things with your hands that don't please God. So what if you can prophesy and hear his voice, but you're listening to things that you ought not to listen to and corrupting your mind. So those things can happen in the life of even a hypocrite. As we read in Matthew chapter seven, Jesus will use you even if he doesn't know you. Yeah. So power is not the primary sign. It is a sign of the Holy Spirit, but it is not the conclusive sign you have the Holy Spirit. The conclusive sign or a more conclusive sign that you have the Holy Spirit is that you have the character of Jesus. You love people. You're kind. How, how about just being nice? There's power in that. How about just living in peace? Wow. How about just exuding joy? These are the signs of having the Holy Spirit. We're about to come to a close. I really want you to look into the camera. Pray for those that are watching now and that will be watching. I want to pray that they would enter into that same divine encounter that you've entered into. So I want to pray. And I want you to believe God that even in this moment, you'll experience his touch. You don't have to beg or plead, just receive it. Father, in Jesus' name, Jesus. I pray for that one receiving this now. Yes, Lord. And I pray your glory would surround them, that they would sense your touch in a tangible way, bring healing and deliverance, peace and breakthrough. We give you the glory, Jesus, for every life mm -hmm. being transformed. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And I want you to say it because you believe it. Say, amen. Amen. 
How powerful is that? Saints, I'm Pastor Morris. I've been here with uh, David Diga Hernandez. Thank you for joining us. I pray that you were blessed.